Thanks, and thank you for the invitation uh, to give a, an update on the status of, of fusion energy. Uh, very sobering talk by, by Sergey. I feel guilty being here, not in back at the lab, actually getting things going, but here we go. What is fusion? So it's the power source of the universe because it's how stars work, including our own sun, which are large balls of hydrogen, which at the center of them, the most abundant element in the universe, hydrogen, is fused together to produce helium, and this is what powers, uh, makes life possible uh, everywhere in the universe. Okay, uh, on Earth, this is a sustainable energy source, and we use a particular form of hydrogen, the heavy forms of hydrogen, to fuse them together. So what does this look like? So you've heard the word nuclear in front of this. So the process that's occurring is the rearrangement of nuclei. Uh, and the one that's familiar uh, to us from fission power plants is you basically break apart the most unstable nucleus. When that happens, it rearranges the nuclei and releases large amounts of energy. Fusion, um, although there's an underlying uh, uh, similarity in the process, is actually literally the opposite reaction. It's the fusion of the lightest nuclei, rearranging them into helium, which is the most stable of the light elements, uh, and it releases large amounts of energy. So what does this mean? Well, I've got a little table here that tells you the difference between fusion and fission. So the energy per reaction and the energy per mass, this, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're going to use uh, units because we're MIT. MEV, what does this mean? Well, you can see this is 20 or 230. This is why these approaches are so uh, fundamentally different than using any kind of energy, other energy source. This is approximately 10 to 100 million times larger than you can get in any chemical reaction. And for this reason, this is why you get um, sustainable energy from both these sources. However, they're very different in that fusion requires a minimum temperature of 50 million degrees, and fission is zero room temperature. Uh, and the products of fusion are helium and a free neutron. And in fission, you get hundreds of radioactive daughter isotopes, plutonium, gammas, neutrinos. It's just that comes from the physics of it. So these, these mean it's, uh, they, they are very different from the physics point of view. So I'll just walk you through this because fusion sounds so mm, exotic, but it's actually rather simple. So what do you do? So this is the energy scheme of fusion. So you take the fuel, which is called deuterium and tritium, which are the heavy forms of, of hydrogen, I'll get to this, and you push them together, uh, they fuse together, and it releases a helium particle and a neutron. And the energies of the particles approximately over here, again in this unit of MeV, is that it starts at 0 0.01, and then afterwards you can see they're more like around 14, and a total of 17. This, this is enormous energy gain. This is why fusion is so attractive. But this also means that the fuel is in the so-called plasma state. It's just the fourth state of matter, this, which stars and our sun is in. And that means that it occurs at around 100, uh, even though it's only 0 0.01 MeV, this means it's 100 million degrees Celsius. Hmm, very interesting. So what happens? Well, where is fusion energy? It's actually in the velocity of the particles. And they are very energetic when they come off. So this helium particle that I'm showing you at 3.5 MeV, what does this mean? That if I release this now, it would arrive in Boston in less than a second. That's how fast they're going. This is the amount of energy that's released. This is why it's such a staggeringly good energy source. Well, what do we do with this energy? The helium, because it has a charge, is part of the plasma. And what it does is it heats the, the remaining fuel, which is back in there because it has so much more energy. Helium is highly stable and cannot undergo any further reactions. This is very important. This means fusion is sustained by heat, not by a chain reaction. Yeah. What happens to the neutron? So this contains 80% of the fusion energy. It lacks a charge, and so it escapes the plasma. And then what you do is you stick matter in front of that neutron, and it, it goes from this very energetic particle back down to room temperature. And when it does this, it provides energy and therefore heat to the surrounding medium. And you use that heat in the example I'll use to make electricity. But it's actually in the end, fusion is a heat source. It's not really an electricity source. And it does that. So that has to be in the solid or liquid phase to stop the neutron. So then you do another thing, which is that you come, when it goes back to room temperature, you actually combine this in another reaction with lithium. This is the, the, it's the lighter form of natural lithium. This produces another helium particle, 
and a tritium, which is the heaviest form of, of the hydrogen. And you, because tritium does not occur naturally, you actually take this tritium and you basically put this back immediately into the system and you, and you reburn it in this way. And this is very important because this means we must get a tritium per neutron greater than one. And this means then we're creating our own fuel to actually sustain this. And in the end, you actually have to engineer this. This is the physics cartoon. This happens in a vacuum. It's like a vacuum, like outer space is where the fusion reactions occur. But the neutrons and the, and the plasma go out and interact with real engineered materials. So in the end, fusion, while it looks like a physics experiment, is actually a deeply multidisciplinary engineering um, uh, endeavor. And these materials, is one of the challenges, actually alter the properties of the materials as they go out because of their large average kinetic energy. Okay, so what does this require? On Earth, it means it's, it's, it's kind of like building a, a fire. Uh, so just like when you build a fire, you have to have enough wood around. You have to spark it with a particular temperature. And then you configure the logs in such a way that burning the logs makes the other logs burn as well, too. So it's very similar, but it just has very different conditions. So the most interesting one is the one that's in the middle, is that the temperature has to be at 100 million degrees. So this is roughly five times hotter than the center of our own sun. Um, and this is because of the required average large energy to actually initiate the fusion reactions. But the density of the fuel, which is very interesting, is, is very low in magnetic fusion. So this is 100,000 times less dense than air. So even though the two of them, even though this 100 million degrees sounds very high, the lack of density of fuel actually makes us quite safe. And in the end, we have to confine the energy in this system for about one second. And if you do this, then fusion on Earth becomes like a star and it sustains itself uh, and keeps itself uh, burning. So what does this mean from the science point of view? Well, we can't actually recreate the conditions in the center of stars because that happens due to the gravitational force. So we replace the gravitational force with a force that would work on Earth, and that is the magnetic force. So why is this required? It's because, uh, in fact, people confuse this often because they say, when are you going to get fusion? Well, we've made fusion in laboratories for, you know, for 80 years. That's not the challenge. The challenge is that when you put it into this state, the particles scatter off each other much more frequently than they actually produce fusion reactions, and therefore you must allow all the particles to be hot. And this means it must have a temperature, uh, and that means it must have containment, a containment system. So what we use is the magnetic force to replace gravity in the stars. This force basically for, this forces the, um, the particles to execute these circular orbits around the magnetic field, the key thing here is that it's the charge times the velocity times the strength of the magnetic field. I'm going to get back to this. This is the scientific symbol B. The important thing here is that the larger the B field is, the larger the force is, because the other parameters here are essentially fixed. And, and then, very importantly, is that this means you must contain this with essentially a virtual force or a force at a distance because a physical container cannot hold 100 million degrees. Instead, we, use, we produce this, this magnetic field with a distant electromagnet that is not in physical contact with the fuel. So this gets a little bit more complicated, but it's important to understand because this goes to the intrinsic features of fusion. So why haven't we gotten this yet? What we have, and, and, and the thing that sounds a little like science fiction, like something at 100 million degrees, has been achieved in the laboratory, in many laboratories actually, around the world. Uh, and this is a plot that has data points on it of the temperature on the horizontal axis with 100 million degrees uh, being indicated uh, at that point. And you can see that there are many, particularly these blue dots called tokamaks, which is a particular magnetic configuration, which have obtained and exceeded 100 million degrees. What has not been actually achieved is the confinement and the density product, because in this, we have a few curves, and this shows the energy gain in the system. So we apply heat to it, like lighting the match on your fire, but what we need is that the, the amount of fusion power greatly exceeds the uh, heat that you're putting to it, and we call this capital Q. And you can see the, the curves of this are, are within this. So obviously, to have a net energy system, you must achieve a gain uh, well, actually, I put it on the bottom. Practical energy systems need really a gain of this around order of 10 because when you take into the other account the other inefficiencies and conversion efficiencies, this really makes us a, a, a very nice uh, looking energy source. 
Now, what, so how do we control this? Well, it's very easy. It's density is actually externally controlled by simply puffing gas into this vacuum. This is how you fuel uh, fusion. So it's 100,000 times less dense than air. So in, in the end, even though it's very hot, the fuel energy density is much less than boiling water. This, this is why it, it's so fundament, uh, fundamentally safe. Literally a breath of my air like that extinguishes all fusion instantly inside of it. This actually was one of the things that makes it difficult from an engineering point of view. There's less than one gram of fuel in the power plant core. So this means runaway fusion energy is physically impossible. It, you don't have to engineer safety into fusion. It's intrinsically safe. But what about this fuel? This, is, and this also is often confusing. So Because I showed you that we use deuterium and tritium, which are forms of of hydrogen. So deuterium is everywhere in seawater. In fact, there's a convenient, there's enough deuterium in this water bottle to provide all of my energy demands as a person for a year. This is how abundant the, that fuel is. Uh, tritium, however, uh, decays in 12 years. So it's not the fuel because there's not an intrinsic natural source of it. But it's actually made inside the fusion plant by the process that I showed you before. The neutron is captured by lithium and other reactions. And so this means in the end we actually make excess amounts of tritium in this. So what does this mean? It means that the, 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 uh, the fuel stock into a fusion device is lithium and deuterium. But this is different than lithium than Sergei was showing in his talk. This is lithium because you get, again, that factor of 10 million larger amounts of energy released per particle. There's essentially hundreds of millions of years of energy just freely available in the oceans to provide this. And that, these are actually the fuels. This is why fusion is an inexhaustible, effectively, energy source. Fantastic. Okay. So this is why fusion energy, no polluting emissions, there's no, there's no carbon, there's no, it's, it's just all happens inside of that. A freely available and inexhaustible fuel supply, you can generate this anywhere and at any time. You, long live, uh, meltdowns are physically impossible and there's no long lived nuclear waste in the fuel cycle because you're producing helium which is just an inert gas. And you can provide energy by the physics of this at civilization scale, fantastic, wow. This seems like the kind of tool that you want to tackle climate change, based on Sergei's talk, but it was too slow. And fusion had a conundrum that the science of this has actually been understood for quite a while, but the practical implication of it was slow. And what I mean by this, well, we had an approach, Tokamax, uh, that had very high confidence in the physics, but was turning out to be slow and big and expensive because of essentially a technology limit that we had hit. Whereas at the same time, and very interestingly, what had happened was people were starting to take other approaches, particularly with this idea of making them smaller, more economically uh, viable, and having a different development path. But those were those other points in that plot and actually have rather large risks in the physics of achieving the necessary conditions. So we thought, could there be a way that we could put something that has very high confidence in the science but it's actually falls fast, small, and inexpensive in the upper right corner. And I put the question mark in there. That's a leading indicator, and the answer was yes. So around 2016, we built uh, this, basically a plan to break the conundrum for fusion. And what was this done? So we really identified a key new opportunity that I showed you that the magnetic field was the key uh, to be able to make fusion occur. And we have to be able to make field with electromagnets that are so-called in the superconducting state, which means they do not consume electricity. And the difficulty with this was that the previous generation of technology, so-called LTS, low temperature superconductors, were very much restricted in the, in the operating space that they were still a superconductor in terms of their temperature, and in particular in terms of the strength of their magnetic field. And what happened was, not developed by us, but in a parallel development in technology, thin film technology of a new kind of superconductor called Rebco uh, was, became available in these small ribbons, which you're seeing down here in this picture. And over on the right, you see this in this yellow envelope, which, is around the, which shows the engineering space where the superconducting state is possible. This is an engineer's dream, that this is a thousand times improvement in the, or increase in the operating volume, particularly it could tolerate higher temperatures and it could tolerate much higher magnetic fields. So why is this magnetic field so important? It's so important and this is a, a quick explanation, this is a summary of, of decades of fusion research. 
So on the left-hand side, as I showed you, the magnetic field forces the particles, the fuel, to execute orbits. And what is the key to this is the size of the orbit. So this goes like the temperature of the materials divided by the strength of the magnetic field. But as I showed you before, basically the temperature is fixed because it's set by that criterion that I showed you. So if you can increase the magnetic field, it re reduces the size of that orbit. And if you reduce the size of the orbit, then this means you reduce the cost of it because you're reducing the volume of it. And this, because it's a diffusive process, it scales approximately like 1 over b to the sixth power. Hmm. The other way, so this is the containment. It's also about stabilizing the plasma. If you've seen pictures of solar flares and so forth, plasmas can become unstable in the sense they want to kind of squish out. So what we do is we use this magnetic field as a stabilizing pressure against the plasma pressure. And then what this turns out to work out as is the fusion power density, the amount of power you make per unit volume, which is the key economic metric, scales like the magnetic field to the fourth power. This comes from basic rules of, of physics of this. So what's the takeaway of this is that a doubling of magnetic field provides, it's not, a, it's not a factor of two improvement, it's a factor of something like 20 to 40 fold improvement in the cost per watt. Uh, and that was what we had in front of us was if we could do this, this would mean that we're going to be able to vastly improve Fusion's prospects. So that's what we did. We came up with a new pla a plan that instead of relying on a physics breakthrough in, in, in containment, it was really one that changed the development path of Fusion by greatly reducing the financial profile um, and the timeline we believed, in fact, of, of getting there. So this took more, though, than a technical innovation. It also took an institutional innovation. This is a quote by Bill Gates that, you know, true energy transformations will require governments, research institutions, businesses, and private investors to work together. So we looked at what we were doing, and we realized that in particular, if our goal was to actually attack climate change with fusion, we needed to think about commercialization effectively immediately at the beginning of this project. So we had the, the director, I'm the director of the plasma lab at MIT, and we'd had uh, many decades of, uh, of, of experience in both building magnets and doing fusion, in, in fact, including many world records in both of those. But we decided to spin out a company called Commonwealth Fusion Systems with the idea that we would immediately engage with the energy industry and with the private investor world to be able to build the machine alongside then MIT to, to in fact develop this technology through making new full-scale magnets with this new technology, going to Spark to show net energy, and then going to Arc to actually make um, uh, fusion energy systems. Why did this work? So this is one, uh, the Klaus showed a nice picture of the, the drone. This went by this, so we basically this is our lab at the Plaza Science and Fusion Center. It's almost an entire block in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And one of the reasons that this worked was because we were able to, to provide research and resources at a scale which is appropriate for actually uh, launching this, this new endeavor. And it was really a new model with the idea that there was a tight coupling between uh, the university and the private company. Uh, again, very much in the tradition of MIT, as you saw the, about how many private companies we've launched. But in this one, we actually came up with a new arrangement that literally allowed the teams to work side by side. So we had the private sector company working alongside the MIT team such that then the technology transfer itself was also accelerated because this meant timescales of weeks or months to actually transfer the technology, not years. And basically accelerating through the dreaded valley of death for new technologies as fast as possible. And really the entire team is focused on one thing, this is one of this is a good follow on to Sergey's talk, it's like we have almost no time to, to make new energy sources. And so we have to go like really fast. Um, and everyone on our team, all the way from graduate students at MIT to the CEO of the company and the investors, we care about one thing. Like we're willing to take the risk to go fast because we've all really run out of time really for this and we need to get going. So what was a really important part of this is that this is totally backed by private money at this point. MIT is really the R&D and educational partner in this endeavor because we don't do directly commercialization, but we are very open to collaboration and strategic partnerships. This was built in to what we were doing all along because we realized it wasn't going to be just us that was going to be able to get this done. So what did this look like? So we, uh, we had a plan that retired risk. 
all the way to fusion energy on the right hand side. So the very successful news was that we actually made this magnet technology work in a record time. It just took us just under three years to do this. And on September 5th we, of last year, we demonstrated the magnet at scale. And then uh, on December of last year, the company announced a $1.8 billion fundraise that would actually give us the funds to go forward to build Spark, which is the, which is the device in the middle, and Arc on the right-hand side, with the idea that this comes in the early 2030s to put energy on the grid and actually attack climate change. So wh why did this make this so different? Well, it is because of this, this sort of puts it into perspective, is that if we take a look at what the consequences of this new magnet technology are, is that the sizes of the devices which are required are greatly decreased. Um, and this compares Spark, which is the middle one, to, to Eater, which is presently under construction, actually here in Europe. Um, and using the same physics, the size of the device was shrunk by a factor of 40 in volume. And so this means a much smaller team um, can actually execute on this, and it also has much uh, 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 better uh, prospects for commercial fusion energy. So how did we do this? Well, we basically adapted at the university much more like a startup attitude, a build, test, understand uh, uh, cycle as fast as possible, but all rooted in very difficult engineering, which I, I'm not going to have the time to go into the details of this, but this is the facility that we made at MIT, on the campus of, of MIT, to actually build and construct and then test actually the magnet. And the magnet is in the inside part of that oval part that you, you see inside there. You can see it's a large magnet and a large test capability. And in the end, we showed that this worked. We basically um, reinvented uh, much of what, what was uh, thought of what was necessary for superconducting magnets, approximately 30 patents involved. Uh, and we achieved o over 20 Tesla on coil. So to put this in the, into uh, pr um, perspective, this is effectively doubling the magnetic field as compared to the previous generation of superconductors. And this was this factor of 40 win that I told you about in the economic prospects. So it's the largest HTS magnet ever made. Very importantly, also featured an attitude of because we were working alongside of the company that's eventually going to manufacture hopefully thousands of these magnets, is that we featured um, uh, very much modularity and new ways of building the magnet to understand about what its scalability would be into industry. Again, all with the aspect that's needed to go fast. So what is Spark? So Spark is the intermediate device. This takes all of that fusion science that I showed you before, adds one new ingredient, this new magnet that we demonstrated at scale. So you can see the person standing beside it. This gives some perspective. That will produce over 100 million watts of fusion power and have a net energy gain of 10. We call this the Kitty Hawk moment for fusion. We know we can fly, although it's not actually a commercial device itself. And this will also provide access to completely new science. Um, and really, most importantly, this does not exist in, a, in, in isolation. It really provides the economic basis to go forward to ARC and commercial fusion power plants. So it is be under construction right now. It's about 45 minutes uh, northwest of Boston on a campus being made uh, by Commonwealth uh, of Fusion Systems. And there's the buildings that are under construction. That's what it's going to look like over on the right-hand side. But we all want to see is ARC, and this is the name for our fusion power plant. And there are very few, um, and you can see that, again, the person standing beside it, that this is, uh, would produce, well, actually, I'll get to the, the conditions of this. So it, it doesn't really have many boundary conditions, except that it needs to be economic. We know it's going to use the new magnets, because those are required to actually make it as small as that. And it'll, it'll adapt uh, 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 some new technologies which are necessary to, to actually make it economic. And the, the key point here is that in order to accelerate towards this, um, really, which is really about the energy and fuel extraction out of this, because that's not, those are not featured in Spark, we basically need to start working on these now. Like if we wait for, this, for Spark, which is going to uh, start operating in three or four years, that slows things down too much. So we are immediately starting programs, in fact, in doing that. So how would it work? So the, the actual device, you can see again this person standing uh, beside it there. So how would it work? So we build these large electromagnets, which are the D-shaped things surrounding that. 
So the high B electromagnets can find this 100 million degree plasma, which is shown in orange in the middle. That's encased in there. The plasma creates fusion reactions of about 500 million watts. Uh, the neutrons that I showed you before leave and heat a molten salt surrounding the, the plasma, which is the blue part around this. And then the heat, in this case, which is shown to make electricity, the heat is extracted to make energy like a normal a thermal power plant. So this is why fusion is so adaptable because, into the present infrastructure because it's really a new heat source. But this also brings um, challenges to fusion economics. And these are mostly engineering, not really, not really physics, although the physics is always related to it. You need to build the electromagnets. They need to be modular, reliable magnets. We're, we're very far along the way on that due to our success in the last few years. But then if you look at the fusion reactions, you must have a very, very effective internal heat transfer. If you work with the molten salt, you have to deal with corrosion, fuel recovery, and materials. And then the heat extraction, which I think is probably the biggest um, impediment, is that we must have very high heat transfer coefficients and high magnetic field and materials that can actually do that. Otherwise, you're leaving a lot of power uh, off. So what would this look like? Well, this is just an example of one of the things that we can do now. In fact, we're starting to build this experiment now. It's essentially that molten salt that would capture the fusion energy at a small scale. You can see it's about the size of a large trash can uh, that would actually use real DT uh, fusion neutrons with the idea that, we, uh, that Spark's mission is to show net energy from fusion. The mission of this is to show that we can actually produce and recover the fuel at a very fast rate. Not only is that necessary to close the fuel cycle, but it improves the economics and safety features of the fusion device as well too. This is a good example of collaboration opportunities really are sitting outside the usual fusion community expertise. This is another challenge that we have in fusion right now because of the pace that we're trying to go at. That until this magnet arrived, I would argue we were mostly interested in improving the plasma physics, which is necessary but an insufficient uh, requirement to make fusion. So this means salt impurity control, corrosion control, MHD heat transfer, heat exchange of materials. These are largely in industrial scale types of problems, and it's one of the reasons we're reaching out to a lot of people in existing industries as well too. But I want to finish with one last example which shows the, uh, the really the flexibility of fusion. So I called, remember I call this ARC, so we're going to do something called ARCH right, right now, which was levering the idea of this fusion technology to try to decarbonize the uh, shipping industry. This is also a chance for me to acknowledge the immense contributions of MIT students in this. So ARC was actually originally designed in, the in a class that I teach. There's nothing like putting about 15 MIT graduate students together and getting them to try to solve really hard problems. It's really one of the great features, of course, of MIT. So thanks to all of them. And, for their, and this is the last version of the, the latest version of the class that I talked about. And what does this mean, meant? It was, well, instead of using that heat to just make electricity to put on the grid, what if we considered this to make ammonia? So the idea was basically make free hydrogen, then ammonia, and we would do this with the idea that we would have shipyard production uh, so that we would be able to host the, the fusion um, core on a large ship, which is shown down in the bottom right-hand corner, and basically using extraction from both the air and the seawater uh, you make a completely carbon-free source of ammonia fuel through, through this. With the idea, too, then, that we would use it as a shipping fuel, and your, the ships would come up alongside this and fuel with the idea of decarbonizing uh, with this with cost-effective ammonia, which is also uh, fairly adaptable into large shipping uh, vessels. So how would we do this? Well, we had the fusion core over on the left-hand side, making just over 1,000 a, a, a megawatts of fusion power, and you can see this, there was the heat exchange and so forth. The ideas about how we would make efficient hydrogen production through both heat and electricity, uh, ammonia production through the Haber-Bosch one, and in the end with the idea that we were trying to hit actually a, a LC, levelized cost of ammonia at around $300 per ton with an overall conversion efficiency of around 43%, mostly because we have a very hot molten salt coming out of, the, out of it. So this is an example of like the things that Sergei was showing, but now adapting this into fusion with the idea that we build an economic model that took all the aspects of the fusion core, average fusion output, the efficiencies of the other system, along with capital and annual cost into the system. 
So this is advanced technology, like we want to operate the molten salt at 1,200 Kelvin, where corrosion problems are, are difficult. Um, we use an advanced helium Brayton cycle, um, and, and then in the end, high temperature steam electrolysis for the H2 production. These are the examples of the things that happen outside the fusion core, where the exotic things are happening, but nevertheless absolutely critical to, to actually meeting the economic targets. In the end, what, and this is the first time in my, I thought, well, fusion must be getting a lot more real because this is the first time I actually asked the students to build an economic model to show me what the cost of the fusion product was going to be like, and we did a, a sensitivity study that basically showed what were the most important aspects of the fusion design to be able to achieve the levelized cost of ammonia uh, that would basically uh, beat traditional sources of this. We didn't actually quite hit that target, but we showed the sensitivity, and not too surprisingly, this was mostly around the fusion uh, power, power density. Uh, and the peak and the basically the thermal efficiency of the system. Not surprises in some sense, but we got, the, we got that uh, indicated, and this was a very... So what, were, what, did we, what did we have in front of us? We knew we had to operate at higher temperatures, and we needed to get better heat transfer out of the system because we were leaving a lot of power on the cutting room floor, so, so to speak. So in the end, it actually worked. We got close enough to our targets that we're, we're, we're working, um, and now with... Uh, the, the company that envisioned this actually to in, in think about more things of, in models like this about how we would adapt fusion, not just for electricity, but for all of those different energy uh, sector needs which are there. So in the, I'll, I'll, I'll just stop here. So just to point out, there are multiple pathways to engage in this. Um, I know fusion sounds very exotic and like, oh, how could, I don't under, really understand that or how would we get involved? But the, the way I look at it right now is that we're at this particularly with the advent of the private sector fusion companies and the adv advent of these new technologies, we're really looking at the beginnings of building the full ecosystem to have a new energy source. Uh, um, and, 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 and I look at the MIT's role as really being at, the, you know, at one of the places that's at the heart of that because we can pull innovations and talent together. And really, the way I look at it, the innovations in technology are just starting. The magnet is not the end of this, it's, it's the beginning of it. There's also a way, so, you know, come and let's d discuss. There's also ways of directly getting involved in the R&D. So energy and tech companies are already coming to us and we're directly engaging on the critical components of the fusion system like materials, maintenance, heat transfer, the, these, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of expertise out in the, in the world in this. And in the end, it is in terms of investment, which Commonwealth, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, as you saw, already raised its, its, its next round. Um, but we're also looking at other spin-out opportunities because when you're thinking of a new ecosystem, there's going to be more companies that are going to be needed, actually, in this as well, too. And, you know, come join us. This is the goal. You saw Sergey's talk. It's pretty sobering. Our idea is if we can get that net energy system working in the mid-decade, which we have the resources now to do, and we can move forward very rapidly to a net electricity system in the early 2030s, we give ourselves a weapon uh, against climate change you know, that wasn't previously available. Um, and because of those aspects of fusion that I showed you before, this can have a, actually have a real impact if we get it going uh, fast enough. So thank you for your attention.